Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Tala. Welcome to Tala Talks NICU, where we break down complicated concepts in medicine and make them easy for you to understand and easy for you to retain, um, hopefully. In the past, I've given this talk and called it um, CBC, easy as one, two, three. I'm not doing that. <laughs> I've been vetoed by Ariana and Justin. They told me it's too cheesy. Let's start with talking about generally what is blood made up of. So what makes up blood? Blood is basically four main parts. Your red blood cells, your white blood cells, your platelets, and your plasma. The plasma is the fluid, pretty much the water, which is kind of like 60% of blood. And it has the um, electrolytes in it. So like the sodium and the potassium, um, all the minerals. It also has albumin and the globulins in it, um, which create the oncotic pressure. So they kind of make sure that all the blood stays nice and tight within the vessels and doesn't just kind of leak out into the interstitial fluid. If you're really sick and your liver stops producing the albumin or your kidneys are really sick and you've got like nephrotic syndrome, which is where your kidneys just start leaking out everything in your blood, um, then you leak out your albumin, you lose a lot of your oncotic pressure and the fluid starts leaking out through the vessels into the interstitial space. So out of the cells, out of the blood into the interstitial space. So that's why people with bad liver and kidney disease end up with like really, really swollen extremities. That's the pitting edema when you just kind of like, you press your fingers into the shins and it just kind of into the, you know, the shin with an S, not chin. You're nodding, so I don't know if you're but thinking like, that it's chin. Like, I know, but I'm just saying, I don't know if you know the anatomy. So, uh, so when you press it in and like it stays in, that's pitting edema. That's a sign that you've got a lot of extra interstitial fluid. One of the things that you should be thinking about is, is the album insufficient? So that's the plasma part. It's also got a lot of the clotting factors in it. Then the red blood cells, which as we all know, carry the oxygen around the body. I will do several episodes on that. Um, and then the uh, buffy layer is basically the white blood cells. Um, also the platelets, which I've already spoken about, so please go back and watch those episodes um, to learn about the platelets. For now though, I'm gonna talk a little bit more as an introduction to the leukocytes. Leukocytes or white blood cells are so important to us in the NICU because they are one of the most important markers of whether a baby has sepsis or not. And if you've learned anything from the other two episodes, it's that sepsis is pretty much what we worry about the most in the NICU. So that stem leuco means white in medicine. It, it, it's Greek or Latin, or it doesn't really matter what it is. But if you just say that, it sounds really Gestalt. <laughs> Gestalt. So, um, so whenever leuco is used, it means that something white is going on, um, like leukodystrophy, leukomalacia, and, and preemie brains. Um, ironically, white blood cell count, white blood cells really aren't that white. Normally, they um, a, a Leishman stain, which is kind of like a purple stain, um, makes them show up. So really, they look kind of purpley when you look at them under the microscope. Um, and they are easily the most intelligent blood cells that we have, which isn't you know, comparing a lot compared to the red blood cells and the platelets in the blood. But the white blood cells are like the ninjas in the blood. They are like the stealth fighters, if ninjas were good. Um, they are like the stealth fighters. So they seek out the bacteria and the viruses and the cancer cells, and they get rid of them before they have an opportunity to go and create a bad infection or a bad malignancy. Um, so most of the time what they're doing is really, really good. Sometimes the ninjas get a little bit out of control and they accidentally think that things that they've recognized as foreign aren't, you know, aren't really foreign. Um, so for example, it could um, suddenly decide, the white blood cells could suddenly decide that peanuts are the most dangerous thing that a human could possibly eat and they could mount this huge reaction against the peanuts. So you have like a huge allergic reaction and the, and the response by the white blood cell count ends up being more dangerous um, than the peanut itself. That can also happen in like autoimmune diseases where the white blood cells suddenly decide that different bits of the body are foreign and they create antibodies against that. That is all our autoimmune diseases. So for example, you could end up with a thyroiditis. You could end up with a type of diabetes because the body has accidentally decided that it should create antibodies to the insulin cell receptors. So the white blood cells are not perfect. Nobody's perfect, right? White blood cells are not perfect. 
Justin and Ariana are nodding, nobody's laughing. <laughs> so I won't take that personally. Ah. So, but they do a very good job at, at keeping us alive. And they are easily the smartest part of the blood. So they've got their nuclei, which is the brain of the cell. So the white blood cells are floating around the body and they're capable of recognizing different bacteria and viruses and different antigens and taking that information back to their nuclei and then creating exactly the right proteins that are needed to fight that specific bacteria or viruses. That takes a lot of programming within the cell, high amount of intelligence. Red blood cells don't have a nucleus. They literally don't have a brain. They've already gotten rid of the nucleus before it gets shot out of the bone marrow, just so that the red blood cell is the perfect shape so that it can carry oxygen around the body. So white blood cells easily the most intelligent then red blood cells which are basically like kind of headless butlers just carrying oxygen around the body and then the least intelligent are platelets which are basically not even a cell they're bits of cells um and they're just kind of like bits of seaweed floating around wanting to stick onto the walls to make sure that more bleeding doesn't happen the cbc altogether is pretty much one of the most important tests that we do order in in the nicu um, and it really tells us a lot about what's going on in the blood. So it tells us the white blood cell count, the red blood cell count, the platelets, as well as the differential of the white blood cells. And I'm going to be talking about that in the next episode. Um, there are a few things in blood that it doesn't tell us about. So for example, um, it doesn't tell us the level of albumin, which we said is, you know, tells us a lot about the oncotic pressure and the health of the liver. It doesn't give us um, it doesn't measure the clotting factors, so for that we'd have to send off the PTE and PTT and fibrinogen, talk about that later. Um, it doesn't measure the reticulocyte count, which tells us how well the red blood cells are being made, we'd have to order that separately. But altogether I would say that the CBC is one of the most common tests that we order in the unit. That was kind of CBC in a nutshell, I hope that you learned something. Um, please like and subscribe, press the button below to subscribe um, if you are interested in any more of these fascinating Nikki talks we have planned. Thank you.